no matter how well you're trained or no matter where you come from, you open your own firm, you, you have to reinvent everything for yourself because it, it becomes the beginning of the, of a culture of how you're going to practice and the values that you're going, you're going to try to live up to. Episode 146. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, you're missing out on the valuable, free, practice-building resources I share only via email. Getting on the list is simple. Visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the green Join Today button. I am your host, Enoch Sears. To get more profit or efficiency in your firm, check out this business tip from Peter Drucker. What's measured improves. Now, I found this to be so true, and as a firm owner, you must be tracking your financial key performance indicators. One of the easiest ways to do this is with a software application like ArchiOffice. Get a live walkthrough of the software by visiting archieoffice.com demo, and a big thank you to ArchiOffice for supporting this show. In today's episode, you'll discover how one architecture firm transcends traditional practice and improves the local craft, impacting the communities hugely in which they operate. The all-in-one secret to managing three very different companies effectively. The powerful strategy this architecture firms use to make more money, build wealth, and make competition from larger firms a non-issue. And have more design freedom. How this architecture firm uses a success fee to get paid for results, not just ours. Today is the second half of my incredible interview with architect Roy Decker, partner at Duval Decker Architects in Jackson, Mississippi. And with that... Here's today's show. So how, how big is your practice um, uh, staff-wise? We have about 15 people. Um, my wife and I are partners. Uh, she's an architect. She's much more skillful than I am at putting buildings together um, and very skillful at assembling documents in, in ways that are clear and organized and uh, easily bid and easily built from. Um, we have, um, so that's the architectural team, about 15. We also have janitors and maintenance specialists. and um, uh, there, there's just a few people that are not doing everything, and those this tend to be the, the janitors. And the, although they they will help us with some construction projects too, um, so uh, about, about 18 people total. It's a relatively small practice, medium sized for our market. Mm -hmm. What what would you think is the key to being able to manage? So it, it just seems from a, from a manager's perspective that having uh, multiple focuses in a practice sort of multiplies the number of things that you have to know and the number of things you have to work on in your practice. You know, for instance, if I'm an architect and I'm doing design and build, suddenly I just multiplied by two the kind of tasks and things and fires I need to be putting out. Um, what strategies yeah. do you use to minimize that and make it not like three times the nightmare? Um. It is, it, that is true. There is more. Um, but in a way, um, there's, in a way there's not, it's really all, uh, think about a traditional design practice. You know, you program the building, you, you might help the client do some historic tax credit applications. You might, you know, you do the design work and you take it through construction and you work through the, with the contractor to a certain extent, we're doing this. It's the same set of activities only we're seizing responsibility for those activities ourselves. We're not actually just being an hourly consultant. This value is a big question for us. What we realized also is um, if we are working as a service consultant on projects, the, the value is always measured by our hourly wage, how many hours we can, how many hours we can work, and we're limited by how many hours we can budget and still make, run a practice. Um, when we're uh, on the development side, when we're uh, uh, developing, uh, helping develop projects, and we're uh, and we use our skill to get historic tax credits or new market tax credits, well, then we're generating equity for a client or for ourselves, and the value of that is not hourly; it's exponential by comparison. So, um, when we're doing that sort of development work as a development consultant or a development, we charge on a basis of a success fee. So um, we're doing some data center work right now for a data center company. And we've uh, helped them understand that if they go into 1950s department stores, which are, by the way, were built really well, unlike 
department stores now. 1950s, 60s department stores are all precast concrete and concrete block and steel frames, and um, and they're empty, especially on the inner city areas just outside inner cities um, or downtowns. We're doing one in Shreveport and one here at Jackson. Both department stores abandoned. Mm. Um, and over 50 years old and eligible for historic tax credits. So um, in both cases, um, we got them on the National Register, qualified for historic tax credits, and, and won um, 7.2 million in tax credits for the Shreveport projects and about 6.5 for the Jackson project. So um, we're development consultants in that, on those projects. We're not owners. But our the basis of our fee is a success fee, ten percent of the of the proceeds we win for the client. Um, the, the, our clients are happy for that. They're, they're paying us what appears to be a big fee. It's a lot of work, but it appears to be a big fee. Um, but they're getting six million dollars they would not have otherwise have had access to as to buy down their investment and increase their uh, ROI. So um, that's another way in which we've change the value structure of, of what we do. Um, I think I got off, off subject on your question, but um, um, that kind of thinking uh, inside the business, changing the value structure has helped us, helped us financially stabilize our firm as well. Mm-hmm. You know, the cash flow for an architectural firm is, you know, everybody works really hard. Um, you get fees per phase or per month per phase, and then boom, you're back down to, zero and you're looking for the next project. So it's peaks and valleys. Facilities management is absolutely level monthly fees. Mm-hmm. And then development, it tends to be bigger peaks and valleys. Mm-hmm. Um, so you blend all that together and it's a business model that's much more stable. And, uh, our, and our staff, you know, can be investors in the projects. They can get equity. They can build wealth over time. We have some profit sharing, but we also have some investment sharing in our firm for on the development projects. Um, so we're trying to build a different way of thinking about, uh, the business of a practice, a practice, you know, make a different kind of practice and and it's all experimental. We really don't know what we're doing. So we kind of go learning as we go. It sounds good. It sounds like it's packaged. Um, but, um, at any given Monday morning when we sit down and try to figure out what we're doing, it's, it feels very fragile. Blazing a trail. (laughs) Blazing a trail. So if you had to cut out one of the profit centers, if you had to say, look, this profit center is the, the most profitable, which one would that be? If you looked at the three different, you know, maintenance, architecture, design, development. Uh, which is most profitable? Yeah. Um, I think ultimately the development will be more profitable, but that takes a long time. I mean, you know, 15 years from now and 10 projects, you build up, um, equity, you build up cash flow in terms of this, the, you know, the, the, the profit that each project, it takes a while to build up a, a portfolio of projects where that is an ongoing growing, uh, income. Um, so I think long term, I think development is an investment in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, um, our architectural practice, we've always been very efficient and as have always managed a good firm. Um, you know, we have, no family resources in Mississippi and no con- connections. We've just been out there just trying to make a living with us, just Ann and I and a, and a group of people. But we've always, you know, we've always been 8 to 10% profitable in our practice, you know, that kind of range. Um, the facilities management um, is steady. But it's not highly profitable, but it's steady. So you have to build a number of clients, a number of buildings to care for. Um but you know it's um, it's probably a little lower than the architectural practice um, profit wise, but it's very steady. So it's at it, its advantage is that there's no fluctuation. More consistent. Yeah. So which one would be the most the most have the most headaches if we could call it that? Um, the development is 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 like a wild ride. It changes every day. Um, you know, city council if the city fails to to uh, put the advertisement in the paper for the, for the TIF hearing, you know, so it gets extended two weeks. It just happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> you know, um, the state of Mississippi failed to approve last year, the renewal of the state historic tax credit. So 
all the projects in the entire state that were using historic tax credits, state tax credits, basically went on hold for a year. So it's 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 volatile in that regard, um, um, and you're at risk. You know, so you got so you got projects that get delayed because the state legislature doesn't enact a bill, which turns out to have been a mistake, and they just didn't understand it. But nevertheless, you got to carry a property for a whole year yeah. waiting for that renewal. So um, it's more risky. Um, so they're, they're each different. Um, the, the key for us is figuring out how to balance them all so that we are, we're never, you know, it's, it's not crisis. Yeah. No, even, though I hear feels, you. even though it feels like it any minute. <laughs> Well, take, take us back, uh, Roy. We'd like to get to know you a little bit better, your background. Um, you and Anne obviously ended up working together. Not sure which came first, the marriage or the, the architecture practice. We just want to hear more about your story. You say you grew up in the Northeast. Tell us about Roy Decker, the person. Um, I grew up, um, you know, in the, in, in the Northeast and was born in New Jersey. Um, at some point, got interested in architecture early on, drawing houses like a lot of architects. Um, my father was a builder. My mother's a painter. It, kind of, you know, it sounds natural in a way. Um, um, I'm a graduate of Kent State in Ohio. Um, I stayed there and got a master's degree and taught a little bit and then moved to Philadelphia um, and practiced in Philadelphia for a big AE firm, Kling Partnership, and a couple other smaller firms, Wallace Robertson taught there. I got some good planning experience and got some good technical training at, at Kling um, and started teaching. I was teaching at Temple at the time and, the, and uh, um, got interested in teaching. Um, so I took a job at Mississippi State. And it's one of those things you do where you say, you know, I'm going to I'm in my 20s. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take a teaching job two or three years, see how I like it. Um, I've always liked teaching. Um, so that was 1990. I'm still here. Uh, I met Anne not long after, uh, you know, I got to Mississippi. Um, we got married. We did get married first. Um, I was working for some other firms here and teaching. Um, and then at some point Anne said, you know, why don't we should be doing this ourselves? You know, we should be, we should have a practice. So it was really Anne that started our practice. Um, and, Is she uh, the more entrepreneurial of the two, would you say? Um, Hunter, I think, I think she's the, she's more visionary, um, but conservative. I'm a little bit more risky. Um, but, 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 um, so it's her guidance that makes good decisions. It's me, it's my energy that gets us in trouble. Um, so the, the good balance, mm -hmm. I think we balance each other really well. Well said. Um, um, so we, and, and I was getting weary of teaching. I was watching, I was teaching fifth year. Um, I had a studio in, in Jackson, which is separate from the school. I was watching our graduates uh, graduate year after year, go into, you know, medium, mediocre firms and then do really bad drive at buildings. I was just watching the practice devolve and then watching the spirits of these students, you know, I would watch them give up. Yeah. Um, so at that point, we, uh, I think one of the things we decided to do was, well, let's make a practice as an example of what a practice could be as an educational force. We, we imagine that we might do this as an, ex, as an educational experiment. So and from still, the outset, that was, it was a goal to make education part yeah. of your focus. Yeah. And get, and make a teaching office. We're proud of the people that have come and worked with us that have gone on to do other things. And, um, you know, we, uh, we encourage them to go to graduate school. We, uh, you know, we, we, we pay for continuing education. We do lots of things to um, help young architects become better architects and, and community members. So, yeah, from the start, our firm was a teaching studio with a, with a public mind. And, um, and also, uh, we didn't know what the, we didn't really know what that criticism of practice or architecture would become at the time. But we had a sense that we wanted to use the firm as an experiment. Um, which is ultimately, I guess, led us to this expanded practice notion. During those early days, what would you say any challenges, Roy, that come to mind where you struggled when you initially started your practice? Oh, there's lots of, there's lots of them, you know? Um, so you, you know, I worked for other firms. I worked for Kling, a big AE firm in Philadelphia, Wallace Robertson Todd, a good planning firm. I worked for Jimmy Lee here in, 
in uh, in Jackson, really good firm, best in the state. <clears throat> so we've worked for really good firms and worked for a preservation architect, a good one. We had great training, but um, and probably and you probably hear this a lot. No matter how well you're trained or no matter where you come from, you open your own firm. You you have to reinvent everything for yourself because it it becomes the beginning of the of a culture of how you're going to practice and the values that you're going you're going to try to live up to. Um, so really, just inventing a firm was much bigger uh, than we thought it would be, and we thought we had all kinds of good experience, you know, but just, you know, doing RFI. Do you have specific examples of what you mean? Oh, just the filing system, you know, creating a good filing system that, um, that, uh, really works, keeps good records, gives you access to good information and, and, um, and being able to learn from your, uh, uh, you know, your good examples and, and, uh, and, and became a master of a checklist, checklist master. So we have all kinds of good checklists, uh, cause she realized you know, why do things twice? Why have to rethink every project when there's lots of things we should, we should just be able to go through and, 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 and you get more staff involved. A checklist is a really handy tool. So, um, all of those kinds of things. Um, some of the early challenges, we were in our house on the second floor of our house with our practice. And, um, you know, we had a baby and, and, you know, if you go to bed at midnight with your coffee at your desk, get back to your bring your coffee to your desk the next morning. I mean, we, you know, it started like many practices with a lot of labor and a lot of hours. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think the hardest challenge was really, uh, uh, just learning and learning business. We knew nothing about business. Um, you know, hiring our first employees and, um, uh, insurance and benefits and accounting. And we, we, we were classic architects, who knew nothing about business. Um, and you know, now that's interesting because now I'm, now I'm involved in, uh, you know, complicated pro formas for development projects and, you know, tax credits and, and incentives and factoring in cash flow into projects. So, I mean, I'm pretty inadequate at it still, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. Do you remember any of those early ahas with the business side of things when you were starting out, when things started to click, you know, or maybe what were the largest business challenges? What I'm trying to get here is, you know, for people starting out or architects who are looking to run a better business, you know, what were kind of your big ahas going from a traditional architect to being someone who's now running? I think we uh, started out thinking that, um, you know, it, it, good design just took more time and then it didn't matter how much time we put in it. We would just put the hours in. And I think at some point I realized that actually being efficient about design effort and capitalizing on ideas and lessons along the way and limiting the palette of things that we do and doing them better and better every project, every year, um, was much more powerful in terms of building a practice than, uh, the, than, than novelty, than being drawn into things because they're interesting. Um, so we, so we build with concrete block and brick and and metal and steel and 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 we eliminate finishes out of our buildings. We like raw buildings, um, um, and uh, and then the ideas that uh, we work with are a relatively small palette. We realize there's a lot of richness in a tight palette of ideas, and being efficient about those lessons, capitalizing and, and collecting those lessons um, in good diagrams and in, in good narratives and um, it helped us a lot because uh, it is about time and quality. Um, it, it's always about design, buying design time, but um, you can really get caught over designing things. And so we, we found that the quality of our work would evolve from project to project if we were true to a relatively small palette of ideas over a practice, over, over years. Um, so that was, a, I think when we realized that and got comfortable with that, uh, it was a real aha moment. And, and, and once that became the kind of, you know, so the conversations we have in projects are similar and, and get better and better and, and get more subtle and get richer over the years, whether it's a housing project or a library or a school building. Do you remember the first development project that your firm did? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, early on, we realized that we were never going to make, a, um, a, a, a real, we were never going to make any, um, 
real wealth, or I don't mean wealth, I just mean retirement okay. funds, um, just w on salaries, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and my father didn't have a high school education, didn't even have a high school education. He worked his whole life and barely got a retirement, enough to retire on, you know, just because he was working salary. And I watched that process and I realized we needed to also invest. Yeah. And um, so early on, we began buying the buildings that our practice was in. So our first development project was a little building that we bought. Um, and it was an old, it was an old life of Georgia insurance building. We were draw Ann and I were driving up the street one day and it was a for sale sign in it. And Ann said, but well, that's a nice building. It looks well built. Let's make an offer on it. And, and we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I, I said, you know, well, okay, you know, but we, we have, we're going to have to give them a low offer. They'll never accept it. Well, it turns out life of Georgia was trying to get rid of their buildings and we gave them a low offer and they accepted it. And then we had to kind of come up with the money and the loan, which turned out to be complicated, but we bought it. We didn't know what we were going to do with it. We tried to lease it out because we couldn't afford to renovate it. And for six months, nobody would lease it. So here we are carrying this building. It was a little scary. Um, our practice was still in the attic of our house. Well, one day somebody called and said, um, you know, we, we'd like to buy that building. And we said, no, we'll lease it to you. And they said, well, you know, how about if we buy it from you? And I said, well, what would you buy? It? What's your offer? And it was 20,000 more than we paid for it. And I said to Ann, you know, we should, we should take this. This is terrific. You know, she said, nope, not nearly enough. <laughs> so I, so I was the broker. I was the communicator and was the decision maker. Um, so I went back to him and said, you know, um, no, we're, we're going to, we'll release it to you. So they increased their offer by $50,000. And I, I went to Ann, I said, you know, this is pretty good. You know, even our banker said, boy, I would take that. Mm -hmm. And Ann said, nope. Anyway, so long story short, um, we, we made a hundred thousand dollars profit in six months because they wanted the building. Turns out it was a, a a, a technology company that wanted to put their server racks in there and it was well-built building. Well, um, the, that was terrific. That was amazing. Um, we still needed a building to put our firm in. Um, and we then ver learned very, very quickly that when you have a profit on a building that you own for less than a year, it's subject to capital, the highest capital gains taxes. So we were about to lose most of it to taxes unless we reinvested it. So then we ended up buying two buildings. We did a 1031 exchange. We learned about, you know, we had, didn't even know those terms at the time, put the money in escrow, bought two buildings, um, and, uh, renovated one for our office and then leased another one out. And, uh, you know, so that started us in this process and it started on a lark really of on one Sunday saying we should buy that building and we got it for a deal. So, um, that has never happened since, but, <laughs> but, uh, the other uh, developments have been a little more hard fought, but, uh, but Anne did start it with that project. So very interesting. Well, just Roy, tell us what you're excited about here for the future. Uh, the firm, you've been doing this for a while. What does the future hold for, um, for your, your firm and where, where are you headed? What's your, what's your big next goal? What's your big challenge in life that you're, that you're wanting to conquer? You know, for 15 years, we would, go after RFPs, get on short lists, interview, and we would get a good many of the projects that we were interested in. And that was the nature of our practice. Um, what's happened in our market, and I think around the country too, is that um, uh, really large firms are coming and joint venturing or buying local firms. And those RFPs now, when we submit on them, we're not really just competing against the firms in our region. We're we're competing against Gensler or Jacobs or, you know, firms with dozens more projects of experience than we have. And so we're not even getting shortlisted on those kinds of projects anymore. Mm. And I think that's a national trend. I mean, I think there's an awful lot of small, medium firms that are, you know, the, the market has changed. Mm. And that's partly why we started doing our own development work too, because we could create our projects, you know, and we could, uh, so the hotel we're doing right now is, uh, you know, it's a 103 room hotel. It's a historic preservation project. We 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 got the tax credits. We're, we put together the equity and the capital stack, and and it's an architectural project for our firm. Mm. So uh, we're not we're not donating our services for value. We're actually creating 
fee for our firm out of our own project. So I see us being more entrepreneurial. I see the landscape of the way projects are built moving from public only funded projects because because tax revenues are down around the country, moving into public private partnerships. Uh, we're doing more of that kind of development for public projects that we're leasing back to public agencies. Um, I see medium sized firms becoming more entrepreneurial and actually becoming better because of it. So that's what we're excited about. So continuing the entrepreneurialism, uh, continuing that, that trend of developing your own projects. Yeah. Yeah. And, and developing public projects, public buildings, um, and leasing them back to state agencies. We're doing a project right now for the university medical center. Um, which which will be their telemedicine headquarters. It's yeah. a private development that'll be leased back to them. We've and the lease has already been signed, so it's uh, we're about to start construction on it. And how does the how does the selection process differ from? Uh, it, it seemed like from what you said that going that route in terms of you being the developer and leasing it back would um, sort of take you out of the competition of the RFP where you know you have competing with there Jacobs is no, and Gensler. There is, yeah, there is no RFP. I mean, we created the project and approached them and said, would you like to lease this building? Nice. So, and it, and we, and, and the, the, the goal is to use things like new market tax credits or historic tax credits to, to allow us to make a, a, a successful development, but also to give them a, a, a really advantageous lease. Mm. So they get into the space cheaper than they could build it. So it's a, so it's a win-win in a way. Roy, is there, is there any question that you feel I should have asked you that I didn't? Oh, you did good. Um, um, I, you know, I think the most interesting thing, um, you know, I so saw I've got 30 years experience. I've been in traditional planning firms. I've been in traditional AE firms and in our own firm. Um, um, and I've taught architecture a good bit. Um, I think, um, Architectural education needs to transform quickly because the firm is the f- firms and the practice is changing faster than architectural education can keep up. Um, I know there are some entrepreneurial planning integrated architectural uh, education programs out there, but they're not enough. Mm. And our and architects, you know, um, tend to like studio, um, but designing a business and and uh, being um, a leader in your business community and in terms of the political, legal policies, those are all design problems too. And it's taken me a long time to appreciate that and find ways to participate in meaningful ways. So I would say the biggest failure I see in the people that we interviewed now is that they are not, um, they're not well-rounded enough. And I, and I don't, I don't mean, I'm, I've never been comfortable with the practice versus education split. I, I live it, um, but um, I, I wish that students would come out of school with more history, more philosophy, more business training, uh, business skills, and good design skills, and see them and see those um, areas as design problems mm. as much as possible. Good. Well, we've been speaking with Roy Decker today, and Roy, it's been a pleasure having you here on Business of Architecture. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. I hope I uh, didn't disappoint. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.